extend to us the benefits of your presence, the power of your spirit. We look forward, Lord, to the peace of mind that you give us as well. So be with each one here, Lord. We pray that we'll be drawn closer to thee, that we'll understand your word like we've never understood it before, that you will be the great teacher here, Lord, and we will give you all the glory for what is done today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now we're in the book of Judges. We're at the 16th chapter, and uh, as it were, we're at the conclusion of the life of, of Samson. But... Uh, I'm sure I'll need several weeks to conclude, so you'll just uh, follow on with me in the 16th chapter. We're at the first verse. And what do we find here? Then went Samson to Gaza, and saw there an harlot, and went in unto her. <laughs> so, it's his besetting sin. Lust. So, of all the heroes in the Bible, we find their uh, foibles, we find their, uh, in some cases, peccadilloes, in many cases, terrible and besetting sins that stain the entire concept of who he is in the sense of being a champion for God. Uh, we look at this almost in disdain and disgust and think, I mean, can't this guy get it together? And, uh, of course, they did not have what I have, what you have. We have something very much better than they did in the Old Testament. We have the indwelling Holy Ghost living inside of us. We have now been born of His Spirit. We are partakers of a heavenly nature. They did not have that in the Old Testament. They had the Spirit who came upon them, but would just as soon depart from them. So, uh, and that lesson is on its way here probably tonight. At any rate, here we are having to consider the besetting sin of Samson once again. Now, we don't know how many times, I think there are three episodes that are recorded here in these three chapters, but how many times did he fall back into this lustful act? And uh, every time you pay a consequence. Beloved, listen, we have these things that we think, you know, it's a, our besetting sin. And somehow we're glad that it goes back to Calvary and that the blood was shed to cover those sins. We're all glad for that. But you know, God intends for us to make some progress along life's journey, don't you think? He intends for us to be sanctified people. We're supposed to be people seeking after holiness, not living in the lust of, of uh, godliness, uh, ungodliness. So, poor Samson, we look at him here once again, he gets to Gaza. Uh, he's uh, been a judge now for 20 years, so he has some maturity behind him, and yet <laughs> uh, one glimpse, maybe one swift uh, sniff of the uh, perfume of Chanel number no. 5, that's enough to do it for anybody, I suppose. And uh, here he finds himself with a harlot, and uh, you'll see the euphemism uh, expression, he went in unto her. So it's a euphemism for a sexual act. This is intercourse. So he went to the harlot, he goes into her house, and uh, goes in unto her. And uh, this uh, will have its incumbent consequence. Be sure, beloved, your sin will find you out. And whatever you think is hidden from the eyes of others is never hidden from the eyes of God. After all, his eyes are in every place, beholding the evil and the good that men do, Proverbs 15, 3 tells us. And so, if you think you're getting away with something, you really aren't. Let us, um, we use the word besetting sin. I'm taking this from Hebrews chapter 12, wherefore see we're encompassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So, you, you know, the idea of we're running a race and that uh, we're running it to please the master and to win the prize at the end of the race. And to do that, well, we have to lay aside every weight and the sin, uh, whatever our pet sin happens to be. You know, the devil is quite familiar with all of our vulnerabilities. He knows exactly what buttons to push. And uh, the tempter has spent his, uh, his lifetime tempting believers and like a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. We're to resist him steadfastly in the faith. So let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. Run with patience the race that is set before us. So uh, those that are running in an Olympic race, they do training, first of all. And what they do is they use weights. And they'll put the weight on and they'll run with the, the weights on. I know a lot of you guys, I can tell you're weightlifters, aren't you? Oh, okay. Yeah, you say that uh, piece of cake is pretty heavy. But, you know... <coughs> You lift your weights and you get, uh, uh, when it's time to actually compete though, you want to take all the weights off. 
I have some pictures here of what they go through, uh, some of the training. I, I can remember going up to a Churchill track and uh, seeing this guy running with a parachute on. I'm thinking, wow, you know, he's, a, he's, he's pushing against all that wind and he has that drag effect. Well, he'd never want to wear that when he's running the race. You take all of the encumbrances off so that you can run smoothly. You know, you're aerodynamic now and you want to be able to run quickly and win that race. You lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. So Paul here uses the metaphor so that we understand we're in training and we're going to put that weight off now. It's time to run the race. So uh, I don't know what it might be in your life. Uh, you all have to decide what your besetting sin is. People often say, well, you didn't put mine up there. Well, I, hey, tell me what it is and I'll put it up next time. But we've got all kinds of, well, sin is habitual, isn't it? Once you do it, well, the psychiatrists like to say that, you know, it's, there's a wormhole in the brain. It's a pleasure path. And that once you've done a certain sin, especially the drug sins, it digs this hole in your brain. It's a pa pleasure path. And you're always looking to get back to that pleasure that was initially yours. By the way, you never get the same pleasure, supposedly, that you got from the first time. And after that, it's, you know, you're always looking to regain that. That's why crack addicts and heroin addicts are constantly hoping to get the next high or the better high. And they never really succeed that in that. So I don't know if you don't see yours up here, I'm sorry. There go the donuts. And uh, right, uh, gluttony is certainly a sin in case you didn't know. And video games, the addiction to that. Pornography, of course, is a big deal. And people can't seem to get rid of that sin. And gambling and uh, lotteries and cigarette smoking and you name it. And bro if I, I didn't have enough room on there, but you gotta put all that aside. All the lust of the flesh. Uh, has to go so that we can serve God uh, and we can serve him unencumbered and we can actually now put the devil on the run. That's the idea is, is to go after him now and to bring light into the dark areas of other people's lives. Can't do that if we're living in the uh, throes of sin. So the Bible tells us about the emotions of sin as it were and um, James tells us, let no man say when he is tempted I am tempted of God. <clears throat> For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and uh, enticed. Then lust, when it hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. The motions of sin, how it actually begins, and it begins in the heart. You know, David uh, didn't go out to battle one day. He decided to stay home and luxuriate. And he's out on the balcony and he spies a woman. You know, the devil puts all these temptations in front of people. And I don't know what women uh, take baths outside or take them without shower curtains, but this Bathsheba seemed to think that would be okay. And, and David began looking and lusting and before too long fell into the sin of adultery and then had to cover the sin because she was pregnant, kill the husband. I mean, one thing leads to the other. And that's how sin is. Sin doesn't just stop. It actually proceeds to more ungodliness. So lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. Sin when it is finished. The wages of sin is death. So that's the equation. It's a terrible equation and uh, we're going to see how this all plays out in our hero's life as well, in Samson's life. Uh, back in the Gospel of Luke, uh, when we spoke about offenses, and Jesus said, Woe unto him by whom the offense cometh. Uh, I did a little word study for you in the uh, original language. The Bible in the New Testament was written in Greek. So we find this word scandalon. Uh, we get our English word scandal from it, as a matter of fact. What is a scandalon? Well, I have a picture of what a scandalon is. It's a trap. And uh, it's set up here uh, with a string that's attached to it. And uh, whoever wants to capture the animal or kill the animal will pull the string and the sticks fall out and then the stone crushes them. This is the scandalon. Of course, uh, to make the scandalon uh, more effective, you've got to put some bait in there, right? Put a little cheese in there. Now, I don't know, anybody have a mouse problem at home? You guys okay with your mice? Because I, I have a uh, device that kills all mice, if anybody's interested. Uh, and you say, well, those poor little creatures have to live somewhere. Well, they can live outside. They don't have to live in my house. But um, uh, peanut butter is probably the most effective. 
And so you use peanut butter with string attached. And forget the old mouse trap thing. I've got something that's a gangplank that goes up to a five gallon uh, water bucket and a diving board. <laughs> and at the end of the diving board, there is a uh, piece of uh, tantalizing peanut butter. They go out onto the diving board and the diving board gives way and they drown. Okay, so uh, I guess you're not too interested in this, but it's cheaper than Terminix. And at any rate, you know, that's what the devil does to us. Puts a little bait in front of us and the scandal and is just waiting. He's waiting in the wings to pull it and to kill us. You can go back to the, our uh, primal parents in the Garden of Eden and, and the foolhardiness. Here, the simplest of tests, you might say. Uh, and here they were. Uh, failing God right from the outset. Imagine this. And it was by one man that opened the door of offense, and that's the English uh, word that we have for scandal and offense uh, that brought calamity on the entire human race. You'll see it in Romans 5, therefore by the offense of one, judgment came upon all uh, to condemnation. And thus, by the righteousness of one, that's Jesus, the last Adam, so the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. So um, I'm glad that God is able to offset the scandal and he has something so much the better and sets his people free. This he did of course on the cross when Jesus himself became an offense for us. He was delivered for our offenses and he was raised again for our justification. Thank you Jesus for all that you did in our behalf. Uh, and of course, his life became an offense, a rock of offense to those that rejected him. Those that were just mere religionists that were working their way into heaven because they were such good people after all. And they thought they'd make it by meriting eternal life that God would say, you were such a good person, come on to heaven. A lot of people are laboring under that lie to this day. It's a trap. It's Satan's religious trap. He has all sorts of traps. He doesn't care whether it's lust. He doesn't care if it's pornography, if it's drink, if it's drink drug, if it's pride, if it's education, if it's religion, as long as it isn't Christ. Christ is our uh, eternal salvation. So we preach Christ crucified to the Jews. He was a stumbling block or a scandal uh, and unto the Greeks foolishness. So um, remember that Peter rebuked Jesus when he said, I'm going into Jerusalem, I'll suffer many things of the chief priests, I'll be rejected, I'll be crucified. But the third day I'll rise again. I guess they didn't hear that part. And Peter said, no, far be it from thee, Lord. Uh, far be it from thee. Now you're going to be the king of Israel and we're going to be in your cabinet and we're going to rule and reign over the Romans and over these fake Jews, you know, in their uh, false religion and so forth. And uh, Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Peter didn't understand the plan of salvation then. Oh, he did after when the Holy Ghost came upon him, and he preached salvation till the day that he died. But up to that time, they were bereft of understanding. They didn't know what Jesus was accomplishing, how he would become this offense for us. Um, Another way of saying offense is uh, certainly in Psalm 91. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night nor for the arrow that flieth by day. So it's all taken from that context in Psalm 91. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler. So the, the fowler, he's got like a, well, uh, modern fowlers at any rate, they now have like a metal hoop. It looks like a, a giant uh, hula hoop for Goliath or something. But it's filled uh, with a net-like fabric that's almost unseen. And he lay, they lay it out into the ground and uh, they bury the net uh, in the grasses. And then, of course, they've got to bring bait. So they bring the seed and they cover uh, the net uh, with the dirt and then uh, before too long the uh, uh, ignorant bird comes flying by, sees free eats and says, hey, you know, you can't, you can't get this. Uh, just remember, birdie, there's no free lunch, right? Down he comes uh, to his own um, death. So the scandal is the devil, of course, setting the trap 
they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. The promise is that through the power of the Holy Ghost and through our great Savior that he can snatch us from the jaws of death itself and can actually deliver us. And you see the word recover there. That's interesting because secular programs like to use the word recovery. They don't like to use the name Jesus though. That's why they're unsuccessful. And that's why people that go into the programs end up going back to the program and relapsing. They don't want to call it sin after all, but it's sin. And it is a choice. It isn't I was born like this, or I have the drunk gene, or I have the drug gene. That's all a lie fabricated by psychiatrists that don't understand the spiritual component. You and I have to make our choice whether we believe or don't believe. We can stop any sin that we want dead in its tracks just by eliciting the power of the Almighty. God can give us power. So don't tell me we've got to do this or that. We can recover. And God's recovery program is a perfect one. They that may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. How true it is, and the psalmist also writes, as a bird hasted through his snare. Sa Samson's about to go and get himself into some major trouble here. Spending the night with a harlot, uh, he got his pleasure in in the night, but boy, the next morning, big time trouble. So as a bird hasted to the snare, and knoweth not, it is for his life. But Psalm 124 uh, tells us, Our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken, and we are escaped. So you can, t you know, people tell me all the time how hard it is to give up their drink. And I said, it's not that hard. Oh, I can't give up my cigarettes. It's not that hard. I can't give up my cocaine. I can't give up my heroin. I can't give up my porn. Who's telling you these things? Certainly the God that I'm talking about is all powerful, isn't he? Don't you believe that? You see, you have to want this. If you want it, you can be free. It's as simple as that. People tell me about the program. They listen, I said, the moment that you want to be free is the moment you don't need a program. You, don't, you, you just need to want it with all of your heart. If you want it with all of your heart, it is your victory. And we find it, of course, that Jesus gives us power. We're more than conquerors through him that loved us. I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Any creature? That's the devil. So who, the devil has to flee from us. He'll, uh, all we do is say, get thee behind me, Satan. But we can't do that without the power of the God's Holy Spirit living inside of us. So he'll cover us with his feathers and under his wings. He'll trust. And uh, there's that word again, scandal. And so even as believers in Christ, we should give no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. Now this word offense, scandal in here is also translated as a stumbling block. Uh, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. So uh, we don't want to be a trap to other people. What you might say is your liberty as a believer to do this and do that. I don't know how many people I have to listen to, to, to Christians, uh, ministers that say, well, it's okay to have a little drink. You can have a drink now and then. You just, you know, as long as you don't get drunk. And I say, well, how do you know when you're drunk? Because it's a liar. Drink is a liar. It tells you that everything's okay when it's not okay. Proverbs 20 tells me, verse 1, wine is a mocker. That means it makes a fool out of anybody that follows strong drink. Strong drink is raging. Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Deceived? It's all deception. Uh, he that thinketh, he standeth. Take heed lest he fall. You see, but, oh, I got this thing solved. I, that, I got nothing to worry about. And I can go into the bar and sit down and just have a Pepsi. They won't let you do it. They will not let you do it. Your friends, these friends that you won't know 10 years from now, that will lead you into all sorts of temptations, forget them. Follow Christ. Uh, well, the scripture in 1 Corinthians 15 is so clear about uh, evil communications, corrupt good manners, simply means that you're around wrong people and you'll be thinking like them before too long. That's why I'm telling you, you've got to be careful what you're tuning into on the television, on the internet, on your iPhone, on your Twitter account, on your Facebook, or whatever it is. There are people out there that will lead you into a scandal and they'll lead you into some sort of besetting sin. Um, what, we're not ignorant of his devices, are we? 2 Corinthians 2.11, lest Satan would get an advantage of you. He's, he's waiting in the wings, waiting to pull that scandal out from under you and crush you with the rock. 
lest Satan should get an advantage of you. We are not ignorant of his devices. Listen, why do you come to church every week? Well, I hope you're coming to be to praise God, to magnify his name, and to learn about Satan's mischief and how Satan is trying to make you stumble all along the way. So uh, you need to hear the word and get in front of the word and get strong in the word because there's no other defense. We got a lot of effect, weakened believers that are out there. They don't attend church or where they're attending. It's just a soft spoken girly gospel. I, I tell you, it's weak stuff that I'm hearing out there. I'm not going to help anybody uh, to go each week and find out how you can be prosperous and how you can be blessed and how you can do this. Listen, we need to first find what it is to walk as soldiers of Christ. Jesus said, you want to be a disciple, take up the cross, deny yourself, and follow me. Amen. Now, if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things will be added unto you. Isn't that right, believers? Hasn't God blessed your life? He's blessed your life. You don't have to worry about the blessing. They'll follow. What you worry about is making sure we're right in the sight of the living God, our Savior. And so verse 2, so it was told that, you see why it's taking so long to get through this. It's your fault. You start saying amen, I could stay at the same verse for a long time. So it was told the Gazites, saying, Samson has come hither. There is he, sleeping with a harlot. And they compassed him in. And they laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city. And they were quiet all the night, saying, in the morning... When it is day, we shall kill him. God keep its prey, Jesus, my Savior. He tore the bars away, Amen. Jesus, my Lord. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. You say, what's that got to do with what just, you just witnessed? Well, all of this has deep, arcane, typolog typological uh, meanings to it. So, you don't want to miss any of what's happening in this story. <clears throat> it's all about Jesus at the end. Amen. So, Samson lay till midnight <clears throat> and arose at midnight and took the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts and went away with them, bar and all, and put them upon his shoulders and carried them up to the top of an hill that is before Hebron. So, I stop at each one of these uh, occasions and I preach Jesus. Uh, it was Spurgeon that said he finds in every text a beeline to the cross. So if I'm going to preach the gospel, you better hear about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus before you walk out of here. And you will. I promised uh, at a funeral tomorrow, I'll certainly preach there. Uh, if I'm uh, preaching at a nursing home, I'll preach the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. I'm duty bound to preach the gospel. So, I mean, we don't need to hear all this other... I don't know, illustrations and stories. I've got them, but I'm going to tell you, we need to hear the gospel. So, Jesus in Samson, you can't miss him, certainly in this typology. So, let's instead interpose Christ bearing that cross. In John 19, 17, he bearing his cross went forth into a place that was called in the Hebrew tongue, Golgotha. Uh, so, hey, there's that quote. Death cannot keep his prey. Jesus, my Savior, he tore the bars away. Jesus, my Lord, up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. So what do I see in this picture? He's taking the gates, uh, the enemy's gates. He's lifting them up, tearing them off their posts and, and carrying them on his shoulders and carrying them up to a hill far away. Amen. So Samson lay till midnight, arose at night, took the doors of the gate, the city, and the two posts. So, uh, so what do we see here? We see Christ uh, there with this patibulum, which is the uh, horizontal beam of the cross. You have the style, which is the vertical, and then you have the horizontal patibulum, which is, uh, in, in those days, of course, there's some debate about how the, all this happened, but that they had actually constructed the styles, put them in the ground ahead of time. Pilate had crucified thousands of Jews. Uh, so they weren't going to go to the trouble of digging a hole and putting it in the post, uh, putting the post in and, and then uh, burying you that way or crucifying you that way. Instead, they would uh, use um, uh, basically a, uh, 
mortise joint and they would cut it out into the style and then uh, a similar or corresponding mortise joint in the patibulum in the horizontal piece and it would just fit right in so they would they would carry people up um, that would be crucified and they'd put the uh, patibulum on their shoulder and they would tie their arms to it and this would be a means of course of controlling anybody who would try to run away it would be impossible you've got not you've got a 60 to 80 pound patibulum on your back and uh, you're bound to it with ropes so we're bound as the lamb was bound to the four corners of the altar in Psalm 118 so the lamb of God is bound now to the patibulum which will be his his altar of sacrifice and so they're going to lift him up here and uh, Hebrews tells us wherefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people and with his own blood suffered without the gate now remember here what happens is that he rips open the gate opens the gate Samson and then he ascends to a hill uh, in Hebron Hebron's about 25 miles away from actually where Jesus would be crucified and uh, where was he crucified it was a place called Golgotha and uh, also uh, Matthew refers to it as Calvary so this place um, no one has completely or uh, been able to accurately describe exactly where it is so we have Gordon's Calvary we have uh, a number of other sites that uh, are recommended to be where Jesus died now I know a lot of people spend a lot of money to go to Jerusalem to see the place where Jesus died where he rose again so but there's no way in the world you're going to see any of those places with any authority you don't really know where any of this happened for good reason because what do people do they'll make sacred a shrine out of a place and and we, we make sacred the Savior and his salvation not the place where all this it's not important that you go to the place and touch the place or sit in the tomb where Jesus rose and so forth. what's important is that all this is believed in your heart we don't need uh, you know as though there's some kind of magic if I touch this place I'll be healed or whatever at any rate so they go to this place called Golgotha there were with Jesus as you know two other malefactors led with him to be put to death and when they were come to the place which is called Calvary Luke refers to it as Calvary that they crucified him and the malefactors one on the right hand one on the left so it's believed to be on the brow of a hill um, and uh, the name here Cranion which is in the Greek language that which is spoken to the Hebrews in Aramaic it's called Golgotha related to the Old Testament Hebrew word Golgoth in the uh, Roman language Latin the the name was Calvarius uh, which was uh, which is Calvary so all three names uh, refer to this place meaning the skull now the fact that it's called Golgotha or the place of the skull uh, in John's gospel would suggest maybe that there was something topographically involved where uh, the mountain where Jesus uh, might have been crucified was actually shaped like a skull and that's what most people believe about uh, the expression and they've even found a place like this uh, not far from Jerusalem and that they believe that that might be the place Gordon's Calvary I uh, think uh, not I think instead the place of the skull simply means when they would crucify these people they would uh, leave the bodies hanging uh, after the long after they were dead there was no trouble there was no reason to bury them they let them rot intentionally this was uh, this was uh, shock and awe anybody that would walk by this would see this and say oh, and that's why they would use the superscription which was a they place a, a placard above your head and they say this is why this person is dying the way they're dying so of course uh, just like uh, public hangings electric chair gas chambers executions of any kind it was all meant to serve as a warning to other people that see this and witness it that you don't want to do whatever these people did and so how, how ironic that above the head of the Son of God is the expression this is Jesus of Nazareth the King of the Jews written in Greek Hebrew and Latin everybody passing by would know why he was dying but uh, normally they would just leave the bodies on the cross uh, let the carrion do their work come down and eat the flesh uh, pariah dogs would come and nibble at your toes and as far up as they could get and eat the flesh and so you can imagine walking past it would be a terrorizing experience to see these uh, people half decomposed uh, on a cross as a result when it was time to crucify someone else and you ran out of crosses out of styles 
what you would do at that point is just knock the bones off an existing uh, uh, half dead corpse or half rotted corpse and you just knock the bones off and it would be a pile of bones uh, beneath that cross including the skulls that would just fall off. Uh, it might fall off even sooner than the rest. So that's how you get, I think, you derive the expression, the place of the, the skull or Golgotha in the Hebrew. Um, I can't prove any of that other than to say that uh, if we're always trying to find uh, a place, I think you could probably go to almost any mountain anywhere and find uh, two eye sockets, a nose, and a mouth. I mean, I look up in the clouds all the time and I see all kinds of faces looking back at me. I don't know about you. And I can do it without taking LSD. But I, I look at something, you know, and there I, I'm, I'm sure I see it, right? Uh, do you remember what was it uh, 10 years ago that somebody had uh, a piece of uh, French toast, I think it was, with the face of Jesus on it. Do you remember this? Yeah. And they sold it on eBay for $15,000. Some people, it's crazy, isn't it? <laughs> it's a crazy world, at any rate. You, you, you can see things that aren't there sometimes, is what I'm getting at. Thank God for the cross. Amen. And so our better than Samson, uh, who comes and decides that he is going to uh, bear the sins of many, and bears them on his shoulders and carries them to a hill far away uh, so that you and I uh, cannot be touched with our uh, transgressions. He has separated them from us as far as the east is from the west. Don't you like that in Psalm 103? Don't you like what Micah says in the seventh chapter that he has buried them in the depth of the sea? Don't you like when God says, their sins and iniquities I will remember no more? Amen. So all of that because of what Christ accomplished on the cross. Amen. So back to this lifting up of this giant gate. Uh, Isaiah tells us prophetically, go through, go through the gates. Prepare ye the way of the people. Behold, thy salvation cometh. Well, wh who's he speaking of here? I don't, certainly not speaking of Samson. But it relates to what Samson is doing here. Uh, and symbolically, it means our salvation. And it all happened there at the tomb. Joseph of Arimathea and uh, Nicodemus, uh, they provide a proper burial for Jesus. They roll that stone in front. It's about 10 foot diameter stone. And uh, no one is sealed with uh, Roman seals around it. Roman guards are dispatched. There's no back door. So how's he going to get out? Well, he's not trapped in there, I can tell you that. And the angels didn't come and let him out. That's not what happened. He was already gone. So he had a body, oh, what a body, beloved. Uh, you tired of your body right now, like a trade-in? Can I be like the guy that's on television, you know, with the cars? Come down now, you gotta come now. Leah, you're in your pajamas, doesn't matter. This deal is gonna go, you know, in five minutes if you don't get down here right away, right? We got a deal for you today, a new model. And the new model, of course, is the glorified body. One like the master, one just like his. Revelation, what a promise it is. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. Former things are passed away. So God said, I've got a new trade-in model for you. And uh, salvation is ours. Behold, thy salvation cometh. So go through, go through the gates. And he did. He got right through the gates. Uh, the angels came later to roll the stone aside to demonstrate he wasn't there. He's not here. He had already risen, uh, raised from the dead in power and in glory and uh, would uh, meet with his disciples later that day. Oh, what a breakout this was. So here they thought they had Samson trapped. They're sure of it. Um, so now all they've got to do is kill him. That was the design. They're going to kill him. Well, the Pharisees, scribes, they were sure when they met in the Sanhedrin, we've got to put him to death. We have to kill him. He's too much of a threat to our little religious society here. He's going to ruin our profits. The, you know, we're bringing money in here. And we can't have this. Hey, he'll take our, our power away from us. The people are already hailing him as the king of the Jews. So we've, we've got to do something about this. We've got to crucify him. We've got to kill him. Oh, they had their plan. They said, we're going to do it. They met in the middle of the night, illegal according to their halakha, but they did it anyway. And they all, with one uh, voice, uh, except for Nicodemus, perhaps in Joseph, uh, said he's to be condemned. 
brought him before Pilate and uh, felt like that's the end of that. They nailed him to a cross. That won't be a problem anymore. But as we just sang, up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph. He went through the gates and uh, he prepared a way for all of us. The way, the truth, and the life. Listen, this is one of the most glorious prison break stories I've ever heard of. Back, oh, I don't know how many years ago. Sweeney, do you remember they broke out of the jail back at the old jail? You remember that? And uh, I think what happened was they, uh, they went up through the ceiling and uh, they got all the way out uh, now the old jail, if you, you guys probably have seen it, it's like the courthouse. It's, it's, a, it's made out of uh, granite block and so forth. And it has all these turrets uh, with slate you know, on them uh, at about oh, a, a precipitous incline. I'd have to say like an 812 pitch. Uh, so uh, very difficult if one uh, would, would get on it. In other words, you wouldn't be able to stay on it. Well, they got up there, but they couldn't get off. So there, there they are. They escaped. It was quite a prison break. They got up, but they couldn't. They, they could, they couldn't get off the roof. <laughs> so I think they finally had to come. And if I recall, the warden left them up there for a while. <laughs> and then, of course, they brought them down and doubled their sentencing. So that's the way that goes. They, and then in the new jail, there's a couple guys. They, they got out through the vent. They got out through the heat exchange or the fresh air exchange. And they're pretty smart guys, you know. They got up and they got in there and they, and they went out. And they got all the way to the end where the air is drawn from outside. And there's a grate there. They kicked the grate off. And then they realized they were about 20 feet up. And they jumped. And um, the one broke his leg. And the other one hobbled. And uh, if you know where the jail is, he started hobbling down the parkway in a red jumpsuit that says ACJ on the back. It didn't <laughs> At any rate, that's a prison break that went bad. <laughs> but um, when you read your Bible, you find out Joseph was in prison, wasn't he? But oh, what a way to get out. You know, when God breaks a way out, uh, it seems like there is no way out. In the case of our story right now, Samson, he broke out of prison. Jeremiah was put uh, down in a well. Uh, into uh, the mire and uh, started to sink all the way up to his armpits. It was like quicksand. And uh, his friends came, Obed uh, Melech, and they got a rope uh, and they hoisted him up out of the pit, out of the miry clay, and uh, set his feet upon a rock and established his goings. Uh, what a prison break that one was. Daniel, if you'll recall, was thrown in the lion's den. And the lions were hungry, you know, they couldn't wait. And here comes Daniel. Now, they wouldn't have enjoyed Daniel. He's all gristle and, you know, backbone. But they didn't, they didn't care. They're ready, you know, probably growling. And then God said, I'm going to send an angel. And the angel surrounded, put a wall of fire around him, so to speak, you know, a protective hedge. And those lions couldn't get it. I bet all night long they're probably pacing around there and couldn't get through, couldn't get through uh, this invisible protective wall. And then, of course, the next morning, Darius came and said, uh, was your God able to deliver you? And Daniel said, absolutely, no question about it. And they pulled him up out of the pit. Uh, a little later, well, before this, you'll even learn of the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they were thrown into the fiery furnace. It was uh, heated seven times hotter than it normally was. They, they made their ceramic bricks that uh, lined the uh, walls of Ishtar and the various palaces of Nebuchadnezzar. And now they were going to throw the three Hebrew boys because they won't bow down to a false god. And uh, what happens but that, well, <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar looks in there through the Pyrex window and sees... He said, didn't we put three people in here? Yeah, yeah, three. He says, there's a fourth in there. And the fourth, he says, is like the Son of God. Oh, wow. And they pull them out, of course, and there, there wasn't even, a, you couldn't even smell smoke on them. The only thing that was burned was the ropes that tied them, and they, they were brought out. What a prison break that one was. I have to give uh, Barabbas here. Uh, Barabbas, the word itself, or the name Barabbas, uh, two Aramaic expressions, Bar is son and Abba is father. So Barabbas is the, the son of a father. And you say, well, that, of course he was, you know. Aren't all of us sons of fathers? And aren't all of us guilty and deserving of death? 
And aren't all of us recipients of the great vicarious substitution that God made when Jesus took my place and he took your place at the cross and we escaped from the inevitable prison of hell itself? I'd have to put Barabbas as being one of the great prison breaks for sure. If you get the book of Acts, you're going to find that Peter was asleep. A uh, day of execution, next morning he was to be, uh, be beheaded and he was well aware of it. Two guards were watching him because he had escaped before from prison. So they figured, okay, we got two guards. He's chained to both. This is impossible. Not, uh, well, that which is impossible with men is not impossible with God. So God sends an angel, shakes the chains off. Wakes Peter up. I don't know how you sleep the night before you're going to be executed unless you have perfect peace. So he had perfect peace and uh, Peter thought this must be a dream. It's not a dream. The angel said, come on, let's go here. What, what are you hanging out here for? And it, no chains. Doors are opening as the angel goes by. What a prison break that one was. Very memorable. You might remember in Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas, they were thrown in a jail because they had delivered a soothsayer, a witch. Uh, a Harry Potter follower, no doubt. Uh, witch and warlocks and all this evil that they teach our little kids in school. But um, she got saved and was wonderfully delivered, the demon thrown out of her. And uh, the master said, that's it, put these guys in jail, they're troublemakers. Uh, but uh, at midnight they began to sing, listen, they must have been singing out of tune. I'm not sure, God said, oh, I better do something about this real quick shakes the prison. What, what an earthquake this is. Only, the only thing that happened was chains fell off and the doors opened. And they made their escape. God de delivered them. What a prison break. Of course, if you read the last book of the Bible, you'll realize that John, the apostle, probably 90 some years of age, if he was contemporaneous in age with Jesus, then I would have to say here he is on the Isle of Patmos, which is an Alcatraz of the first century. Tradition says they tried to kill him, but he didn't, he didn't boil very well, apparently. They put him in boiling oil and survived it. Tradition, not the Bible. But the Bible does say he was exiled to the Isle of Patmos for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And he was on the Isle of Patmos when God delivered him and said, Come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately he was in the spirit. Uh, I'll tell you, the guards probably had a problem explaining that to the warden that night. And then, of course, the greatest prison break of all, when Jesus on the third day rose again from the dead. Beloved, we're gathered here this morning because we celebrate what Christ did in victory that day. He rose again in power and victory. I know that they tried to do their very best. They sealed the tomb off. They're sure that they've got him captive. He can't get out. There's no back door. Uh, but Jesus, uh, when it came time and that moment came, he was raised from the dead in glory and in power and then ascended to the right hand of God where he is this morning, 2,000 years later. And he's waiting to hear the cry of penitent sinners. He's waiting for someone in this church perhaps to say, I devote my life to you, Lord. I will live for you all the days of my life. And I will try to please you with my life. And no more besetting sins will I get, make excuse for and say in my life, well, you know, I'm, uh, we're all, nobody's perfect, you know, or I'm not Jesus. We won't make excuses. We'll live for the one who loved us. We'll, we'll become sacrifices, as Paul said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present yourselves a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's our marching orders, beloved. Not to live for yourself and see how prosperous you can become and uh, uh, what clothes you can wear and uh, where you can go for entertainment. God wants us to be his soldiers, uh, living sacrifices, finding his will and living his will out every day of our lives. And hopefully being able to snatch some poor victim who's perishing in hell. We can snatch them from the fires itself and bring them to Christ. Amen. So let's pray, Lord. Here we are at the end of, a, I hope, a fascinating lesson. Help us all to learn from this lesson, Lord. First of all, we see our, our champion, our hero, and Lord, we're ashamed as we read the account that he would be given over so easily to the lust of the flesh what a besetting sin it is, Lord. And how the devil is capitalized in so many people's lives using this very sin to destroy them. Uh, 
Lord, there are many sins that we commit without the body, as Paul writes. But the sin of fornication, we sin against our own body. Help us to realize this. Let us be faithful to you, Lord. Let us not be some fornicator, some adulterer. Let us decide to live our lives in a pure way that would please the one who loved us, who sacrificed and gave up his rich, royal, redemptive blood to free us from the gates of hell itself. We're thankful, Lord, that the gates of hell can no longer prevail against us, that our great hero tore the bars away, made an, uh, an ingress into heaven itself, and a departure from the old life. We're thank thankful, Lord, that you carried our burdens, uh, that you gladly, Lord, gave up your life, that you were bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon you. And with your stripes, we are healed. We come to you this morning, Lord. We ask forgiveness for our sins. We pray, Lord, that you will come into our life and forgive our sins, that you will become now our Savior, our Lord. Give us power of your resurrection, Lord, and help us to go forth being a light to a very lost world. Help us to realize that all about us there are friends and relatives who are living devoid of this light. It is up for us to be a witness to them, not to fall in with them, we're instead to be separated from them and to show them a better way and to point them, Lord, because we ourselves were trapped by these very same besetting sins. But you saved us long ago, Lord. You came into our life and you gave us victory. Help us to be victorious believers, as you promised, more than conquerors through him that loved us. And then, Lord, we pray that we might shake this world, this evil and present world that we're in, Lord and that we'll, we'll bring the power of the gospel to bear upon many a conscience. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. See you tonight. I invite you to accept the plan of salvation that God has laid forth from the foundations of the earth. And the first point of that plan is that all have sinned. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. So begin by confessing your sin before God, that you have sinned against Him. and You can't even recollect all of the times that you've offended Him. He has the record, and that record needs to be expunged. Secondly, it's important to know that God will punish sin. If it goes without atonement, we will pay the ultimate price. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that eternal price is hell, fire, and brimstone. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. But Jesus paid the price and made the atonement on the cross. God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, much more than being now justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. When Jesus died, he said, it is finished. He made an end to our damnation and our debt that we owed to him, paid by his own blood and justifies us before a holy God. On the third day in triumph, Jesus rises from the dead. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So call upon him today. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation.
Come in to stay. Come in to.